It's such a pleasure to see you all on this first work day of the summer. Thank you for joining us. <coughs> I can understand that the dream of the 18th century philosophers, to me beautiful, is not for everyone. I personally like the universe. They took over from Spinoza, regular, orderly, and above all comprehensible by the rationality that the divine artificer gave mankind before absconding from his creation. By using that God-given reason, the philosophes thought, we can find out those laws of nature ordained by the creator, including the laws of our own human nature, and we can fashion and ultimately perfect our behavior, our morals, our society, and our laws according to it. As much as I love it, I understand that this is, at least in part, only an intoxicating vision. And I understand why doubt so quickly set in. As Joseph Addison rightly conceded as early as 1712, the music of the spheres is not a real music, but one only audible to reason's ear alone. Little wonder that the reign of feeling is distinct from reason so quickly asserted itself that, me that men began to boast of their sensibility and cry in public as an outward sign of inner fineness of sentiment. After all, people were right to say that there are other ways than reason through which we know about the world and ourselves. There is intuition, there is sympathy, there is even romantic mysticism, and more. After the terror at the end of the 18th century had shown how much devouring unreason the republic of reason could itself unleash, it's even comprehensible how interest turned all the more to the occult and supernatural, to mesmerism and visions like Coleridge's opium dream of a damsel with a dulcimer. But even granting the further rationalist terrors that visited the world. Most recently, a modern nation setting up a fully bureaucratized industry for exterminating an entire people, or an archipelago of intellectuals, reason's guardians, proselytizing for a crackpot theory of reason working in history that served to kill millions and enslave more, even granting all this, how did we moderns ever turn from reason to sex, drugs, and rock and roll? <laughs> how did we ever come to think that there was an ecstatic and wise higher consciousness reachable through what is rightly called dope? <laughs> or that transgression in such a state is somehow mitigated. I don't have a high enough consciousness to get it. Like Aristotle, I prosaically believe that one who transgresses under the influence of a mind-altering substance is doubly guilty, not only of the crime, but also of dispossessing himself of the reasoning power that inhibits crime. To explain these mysteries, I call upon my dear friend and colleague Theodore Dalrymple who, behind that increasingly famous nom de plume, is a recently retired British doctor named Anthony Daniels, a City Journal contributing editor and the Dietrich Weissman Fellow of the Manhattan Institute. Tony is the author of the just-released Romancing Opiates, a wise, engaging, and fascinating book that sheds brilliant light on the myths and realities surrounding modern drug use. As a psychiatrist in a slum ward specializing in drug overdoses, and as a GP in a prison filled with addicts, Tony brings a wealth of hard evidence to this task. But Tony's firm grounding in real experience, in real experience isn't this book's only signal advantage. It also benefits from the wide reading and profound thinking that have made Tony, as evidenced by his two previous books of City Journal essays, Life at the Bottom and Our Culture, What's Left of It. 
the finest literary and cultural critic, as well as the foremost social commentator of our age, Tony Daniels. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's always a great pleasure to come to New York. Uh, but even if it weren't, I'd come every year just to hear Myron say these things about me. <laughs> of course, I wouldn't take them seriously unless he uh, uh, were the editor of the uh, uniquely excellent uh, City Journal. Well, ladies and gentlemen, my uh, subject today is opiate addiction and the way that it has been misconceived for nearly two centuries. And the subject, while of perpetual interest, is not perhaps of the first importance when it comes to our, uh, the problems that our society uh, faces. Uh, but it's an interesting and perhaps uh, emblematic example of how error may become ingrained and how the most obvious facts uh, may be ignored and uh, their significance overlooked entirely. It's my contention that uh, most of what people think they know about addiction, I'm talking about the man in the street, of course, um, uh, and other opiates is not only wrong, but obviously wrong. Uh, perhaps I can best illustrate this by uh, giving in outline what I think most people uh, believe about heroin addiction and then uh, pointing out the errors uh, that it contains. According to what one might call the orthodox or official version, a person somehow or other uh, comes into contact uh, almost at random with heroin, which he is deceived into taking uh, without knowing what he is getting himself into. Uh, he finds it pleasurable and takes it a few times. Uh, and then he is uh, hooked on it, as the expression goes so that if he tries to stop taking it, he suffers the most horrible, the most agonizing and terrible withdrawal symptoms uh, which no person uh, could reasonably be expected to undergo of his own volition. He therefore has no choice but to continue. Unfortunately, however, his habit destroys his ability to work and he therefore resorts to crime in order to pay for the heroin that he must now uh, take. All is not quite hopeless or lost, however, because treatment uh, is available, if only it will make itself available uh, to the addict. And this treatment consists largely of prescribing drugs of a similar but not identical kind to the heroin addict uh, that he is already taking. If, but only if, he has the right treatment, he can abandon his habit. Now, all of this is nonsense and obvious nonsense. To suggest that the average uh, heroin addict in our inner cities has no idea about heroin before he starts taking it, it is, is to display an abject uh, ignorance of the social conditions uh, prevailing in our cities. When young addicts used to say to me by way of explanation of their habit uh, that they fell in with the wrong crowd, I uh, used always to reply that it was remarkable how I met large numbers of people who had fallen in with the wrong crowd, but I never met any members of the wrong crowd itself. <laughs> <laughs> and though these addicts uh, were neither very well educated nor even particularly intelligent, I never met a single one who didn't start laughing. And their laughter meant, of course, that they entirely understood the point that I was trying to make. People who are given opiates after operations, sometimes for days, do not become op addicts in the sense that uh, I'm talking about. Moreover, it's been shown that heroin addicts have to make considerable efforts, in other words, to be determined to become addicts and addicted. And on average, it takes them about a year or so. In other words, heroin does not hook them, they hook heroin. And this, I venture to suggest, is a typical example of the way that when we think about social problems, or many, the way many of us think about social problems, we ascribe agency not to agents, but to inanimate objects and substances and forces. <laughs> 